ended the first session after my head disappeared due to my camera fogging up, uh, discussing economics and government, sort of a look at public choice theory, and we'll have references if you want to read more on this particular uh, way to use economics to talk about public policy issues and government uh, responses. So uh, themes for extemp for parliamentary debate, world schools debate. First, an overview, society versus the state. In a whole range of uh, areas, we have different institutions and societies that deal with them. In the technology industry, we have companies like Apple and Microsoft and dozens of others that uh, build laptops and provide software. In education, we have uh, public schools, Catholic schools, private schools, uh, classical schools, homeschooling. Uh, in mail, delivering packages and letters, we have the US Postal Service, we have FedEx, we have UPS. And in each of these areas, these institutions range from voluntary organizations that are firms, uh, associations, companies of various kinds, and government agencies, local agencies, state agencies, federal agencies, for security, we have private security companies, and we have uh, police, uh, state police, city police, federal government agents. So in all these areas, we talk about social institutions. Some of these institutions are voluntary, where people get together and persuade each other to uh, you know, join their uh, plan, organization, firm, get together as associations, go to church. Each of these things are voluntary institutions, with the exception of the state. The city, state, and federal governments require coercion, that is, they collect tax revenue by force or the threat of force, and they have the ability to you know, confiscate property and put people in jail and so forth. And finding the dividing line between private organizations and voluntary organizations and state organizations, coercive organizations, is a challenge. Garbage collection could be done by private companies or could be done by the city or the county. Um, this discussion of what's the pro proper role of government in a free society is a core issue that, that uh, separates different companies, the Soviet countries that is. The Soviet Union had the government run most everything. Uh, Cuba and Venezuela, the government has run most everything. Hong Kong is the most decentralized private company uh, country in the world except it's no longer a country. It was a, 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 a charter city from England, and now it's part of China. But again, a huge variety in how you organize social activity, voluntarily or coercively. The founders put restraints into the Constitution that limited the role of government, limited where coercion was appropriate. So public choice economics talks about the incentives of government agencies, versus private sector agencies and makes the claim that people are pretty much the same in their incentives, but when they're in different institutions, the successful executive at a private company uh, can expand his company by providing services to the public. If he suddenly becomes a gov works for a government agency, head of the FCC or the FDA, he's still an individual with incentives, with desires to earn more income and accomplish more be more successful, but that can include having a larger company in the private sector or having a larger agency in the public sector. The company he runs might want to get into new areas, provide new goods and services, hire hundreds, thousands of more people, but the government agency he runs, he has the same incentives or similar incentives. He might want to expand FDA authority to new areas expand uh, FCC, Federal Communications Commission authority, to manage the internet, which is what's just happened in the last uh, uh, months, where the federal government has decided to regulate the internet, just like it was a, a, a telephone utility from the early 20th century. So again, looking at different ways to manage social organization. An essay very valuable on this is called I Pencil by Leonard Reed, and it just looks at the the claim that no one in the world knows how to make a simple pencil. A pencil that we take for granted that's so cheap we break them in half and throw them away, yet making that pencil involves thousands, tens of thousands of people spread all over the world who you know, know which trees uh, to make the 
pencil uh, wood from to know the clay and graphite to make the lead. And each step of the way, that decentralized knowledge, we benefit from that in an open society because of international trade and exchange, where that knowledge all around the world that's divided between all these different people is mobilized by the market system, by private companies to provide a pencil. Uh, a more sophisticated version of the same theme is F.A. Hayek's essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society. And he talks about how you know, a flood in a copper mine in Chile might decrease the world supply of copper ore and copper by 20%, 30%. How is the world going to accommodate that, this sudden shortage of copper? Well, it turns out that bidding by uh, copper refiners is going to raise the price of copper which for people that make copper plates and jumper cables and other sorts of things, uh, they will change their behavior and raise prices. And in the end, the consumer comes into a grocery store or a, a, a Target deciding to buy a pan and may decide to buy an aluminum pan because the copper one has gone up in price a dollar. So voluntarily, instead of a mandate that everyone cut back copper consumption 20% in the world, which would lead to a scramble and coercive efforts, the price system rations scarcity across the world voluntarily just by adjusting the price up, which leads to all sorts of incentives by people at companies to, to get what they want with slightly less copper and so on and so forth, or put off using copper until the price goes down. So this spontaneous uh, cooperation effect, you know, 500 million people cooperate to reduce their use of consumption, reduce their use of copper for six to eight months while the flooding recovers in Chile. But no one, none of these people even knew about a flood. They just knew that the price went up slightly and they altered their behavior slightly to accommodate that. And you can imagine this happening throughout thousands of different products with fabrics, with raw materials around the world. So this requires prices to adjust, requires companies to be free to change their operations, entrepreneurs and enterprises to adjust. So these sort of core benefits of prices and exchange in the market economy are, are part of what brings us such tremendous prosperity in those countries that have the benefit of uh, free, free societies and open, open economies. So part of the benefit of exchange, benefits of exchange. Adam Smith talked in The Wealth of Nations about, uh, you know, if you're making pins on your own, how many could you make in a day? But if you have 50 people in a factory, each specializing in part of pin making, uh, you can make far more than you could by yourself. And later with mechanization, the machines could make a million times more than, than people could on their own. Okay. So another sort of core idea to look at in comparing countries is the Economic Freedom Index. And these are measures, 10 separate measures, that compare economic freedom around the world. And maybe I'll cut out and play the video for just a bit on this, uh, just a three-minute video explaining economic freedom. Last sort of core issue I wanted to start with is the, what we call the Revolution in Development Economics. In the 1940s and 50s and 60s, after World War II, there was a belief that uh, the United Nations and foreign aid uh, and international development groups like USAID or the World Bank could um, boost economic development working with governments and that instead of having the free market system boost economic growth, countries like India, countries in Africa and Latin America the governments could step up, hire economists, advisors, experts, and set up state-owned enterprises, uh, raise tariff barriers to protect domestic industry, and take a whole series of steps that they thought would boost economic development, would allow really poor countries to move into the world of developed economies. You can see this in the history of Brazil. Even in the 1960s, uh, there's a um, National Geographic cover story on Brazil about how big the economy with it was, how much natural resources, and predicting that within 10 or 20 years, Brazil would become one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And then, you know, 50 years later, still Brazil is still very poor compared to its uh, potential. But on the other side, countries that were poor in 1950 and 1960, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, those countries took off 
uh, through uh, decentralized market economies, uh, more open trade, encouraging, allowing foreign investment. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea went from poverty to prosperity from the 50s to the 80s and have continued and followed by Malaysia. Uh, other countries in Southeast Asia, Vietnam has been booming the last few decades. Communist China moved toward market reforms in 19. 80 and then India followed in the early 90s and so a couple billion more people have had the advantage of international investment, international trade and deregulation that boosted economic growth. So this revolution, you know, in 1950s all the countries in Latin America were wealthier than all the countries in Southeast Asia. By the 1980s that had reversed and it's continued. Uh, later, countries like Chile, which is the poorest country in Latin America in the 70s, early 80s, now is the wealthiest country in Latin America because it moved from a government-controlled, regulated economy to an open market economy with a, a sort of a, mostly a free enterprise system. Ireland, also poorest country in Western Europe in the 80s, wealthiest, one of the wealthiest countries in Western Europe now. Peru also is recovered. So. Those few stories, uh, society versus the state, the core constitutional that the founders view, the constitution restricting government intervention in the economy, eye pencil use of knowledge in society, benefits of exchange, division of labor, and using the economic freedom index to measure economic development around the world, those countries that have legal institutions that allow, encourage economic uh, enterprise uh, tend to prosper. So, the economic way of thinking about the world, there's many ways to uh, teach economics, many kinds of economics. Uh, you often hear about micro and macro and development and labor economics, industrial economics. But in terms of economies, we think about tribal or traditional economies, we think about command economies, and we think about market economies. But most economies in the modern world are mixed. They're part traditional, part command, part market. In the United States, we have a free market economy, sort of, but the government runs most of education, most of retirement through Social Security, a huge chunk of the healthcare industry through Medicaid, Medicare, uh, Afford Americans, uh, uh, for <laughs> Obamacare, I was trying to think of the proper name of it, um, and the, the interventions in the medical care industry since the 1920s. So. In the US, we've got a mixed economy, and when things go wrong, people that want more government involvement and more regulation can blame the private sector. People enthusiastic about the private sector and free enterprise can blame, uh, can blame government taxes, subsidies, and regulation. Your job as a debater is to try and sort through these issues with reference to whatever the uh, motion is in world schools or the topic is in extemp, and try and present the different perspectives uh, let the audience weigh that and then uh, let the audience know what your view is or what the, hopefully what the, the views you find most compelling. Adam Smith's considered the father of modern economics with his book, The Wealth of Nations. He certainly didn't originate the ideas of in favor of trade and skepticism of mercantilism, that is of government control of the economy, but he advanced it tremendously. The uh, full title of this book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Now, what Smith is doing is sort of, he's, he's in Scotland, and Scotland was one of the poorest areas in Western Europe, in all of Europe, in the 1500s and 1600s. 1500s, 1600s, France was the wealthiest country. Spain was wealthy in, in basically taking so much silver from the New World and wrecking the societies there. Uh, but Scotland began to prosper. Adam Smith is looking around in the mid-1700s and noticing that the average person is living better than their parents lived and their grandparents did. They have you know, nicer homes, uh, better diet, more food, better clothing. And he's trying to get a sense of where this prosperity comes from. And he argues it comes from allowing free trade. When Scotland sort of merged with England, it had more range for scope and trade. People could uh, build enterprises more easily. And he spells out the uh, advantages of mercantilism, uh, of markets, instead of mercantilism, 
for the advance of Scotland and, and lays out the groundwork. groundwork. Uh, one of the nations very uh, influential in the United States, the Scottish Enlightenment with David Hume, Smith, Adam Ferguson, and others, uh, advance the role of the private economy and free enterprise against sort of government regulations. And that in the teachers of Thomas Jefferson and other founders were Scots. So very, very big influence in the US. And these classical liberal ideas were also uh, advocated in, in France, in England, with a whole range of scholars promoting uh, an alternative to aristocrats trying to run the economy. So macroeconomics tends to be the study of big stuff, of whole economies. But the, the study of macroeconomics is sort of in turmoil. It used to be thought of during the Keynesian times uh, which is the you know 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, as the study of managing the economy, of governments managing fiscal policy, which is uh, spending, government spending programs, and monetary policy, which is how the central banks controlled the money supply. And the idea is that economic advisors were sort of wizards giving advice to uh, government officials on whether they should boost spending to stimulate the economy or cut back spending to reduce inflation or to reduce unemployment with new spending or tax cuts. John F. Kennedy, Kennedy was proposing tax, tax cuts in much the same way as Ronald Reagan did to uh, boost the, the economy. Okay, so that was macro. Macro very much now, uh, Keynesian economics sort of uh, Decline dramatically in the 1970s because we had stagflation. We had high inflation and high unemployment. These two were supposed to trade off. And the monet monetarist economists, economists like Milton Friedman, who believed more in monetary policy, argued that the government was just printing way too much money that Johnson, President Johnson did to fund the Vietnam War and the Great Society programs. And that inflation was disrupting society in various ways. The monetarists called for reducing money supply growth. Uh, Austrian economists, another school of econom economics, argued that uh, boosting the money supply disrupted uh, economic decision making in society. But following uh, the influence of Milton Friedman and the pullback in the, the monetary growth, uh, that led to a recession in the early years of the Reagan administration. And when Reagan, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher came to power, they dramatically cut back, or they, they, they advocated less government. They pushed privatization, deregulation, uh, sound money, free trade, and the argument that they made and supporters of markets make, like Milton Friedman, was that these steps boosted the US economy, led to tens of millions of new jobs, a dynamic economic growth, resurgence of economic growth. And we benefited that from the mid 80s, from the tax reforms of 82 and 86, all through 2005 of decades of stunning economic growth in US and in Europe. Now, on the other side, critics of Reagan and Thatcher say that their policies uh, caused problems. That is, that their, their anti-government rhetoric and policies led to growing inequality, led to financialization of the economy, uh, harmed, very, harmed unions by re weakening labor laws. And as a debater, again, I encourage you to look at the, the strongest cases you can for these different uh, positions and try to decide for yourself whether it was the market reforms and reduced regulations that boosted the US economy or whether uh, things got worse in various ways because of this. Uh, so there's some debate in the US and in England, but around the world, it's pretty clear that the deregulation efforts and the free enterprise opening the economy in communist China and India, and to some extent in Latin America, led to a stunning resurgence in economic growth. The lessons learned from Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea were emulated in China, where China started a series of free enterprise zones in 79 and pushed those uh, reforms in the 80s, welcomed foreign investment. Uh, China had a huge, stunning resurgence, or resurgence of growth. No one expected China to grow so fast for so long. China's economy is, is not as solid now as it was, 
but in terms of size, it's fantastic. Same with India. 7-8% economic growth in India year after year for a decade. The Indian economy has expanded dramatically. And that those two by themselves have lifted, you know, well over 2 billion people. Uh, well, not all of them, but half of them, most of them, uh, out of deep poverty. We've got the f smallest uh, amount of poverty, people living under $1.25 a day in the history of the world now, even though the population has surged. And that's directly because of the market reforms in China, in India, in Latin America, and to some extent beginning finally in Africa. So more on this. There's obviously more on all these issues and debates, and there's problems still. But uh, macroeconomics is now considered the study of what allows an economy to grow, what encourages uh, uh, prosperity in the economy in an area I haven't talked about the Middle East. Why is the Middle East so much in turmoil? Well, there's religious conflict and problems there, but economists would argue you lack economic freedom across the Middle East, with the exception of Dubai, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, uh, most of you know Egypt, Iraq. You can't get a permit to start a company. You can't get title to your house. It's almost impossible to borrow money. You get harassed by government officials. So the, the violence and poverty we see in much of the Middle East is still linked to economic, the lack of economic freedom. Reporters complain about people not voting and they want to push democracy. But democ lack of democracy is not why people are poor. People couldn't vote in Singapore. Uh, South Korea and Taiwan were very much uh, central government. Con uh, not a lot of political freedom in the 60s and 70s and 80s in those countries. China, certainly now people don't vote. But the prosperity has increased because people are free to work, to start a business to save their money and to make their own choices, not as much as we might like, but that's a core issue. Okay. Now, another way to look at this is a book called Invisible Wealth, The Hidden Story of How Markets Work. And I'm drawing from an article called Our Intangible Riches, based on a World Bank study of 2005. Just consider this, you know, look at the nature of wealth. I got the leaves in the wind out here. Uh, oil, soil, copper, uh, forests, we think of these as wealth. There's oil in the ground in Texas and the Middle East. There's rich topsoil for farmers in Iowa and in other areas of the world like Ukraine. Uh, there's copper mines in Australia um, and Brazil, um, rich forests around the world. These are all forms of wealth and so are factories, houses and roads. But according to this uh, World Bank study, these solid goods, these natural resources are only about 20% of the wealth in wealthy countries, in rich nations, and 40% in poor countries. So they're, they're significant, they're important. But most of the prosperity, most of the wealth, um, again, 20% are material things in rich countries, that's 40% of the wealth in poor countries. But human capital, that is the knowledge we have in our head, the uh, um, the traditions we have, the respect for rule of law, the level of trust between people, uh, that is the largest source of wealth in virtually all countries. Um, it's human capital and the value of institutions. Oh, and something just shut down, so I'll stop.